Well, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you very much for listening to me and be willing to listen to me speaking in English. Um, I come from a medical family. Um, I grew up in Northern Ireland. My father was a specialist in community medicine. My mother was a nurse. Uh, my sister became a nurse and, and married uh, someone who went on to pioneer magnetic imaging. So I come from a family where this whole business of medicine is taken very, very seriously. And I went up to Oxford University to study chemistry and then did um, doctoral research under Professor Sir George Rader in the field of molecular biophysics. And I was looking at physical methods for investigating biological systems. And I worked in a research group at Oxford which focused on the use of nuclear magnetic resonance uh, techniques for investigating the human body. And of course, the whole um, magnetic imaging um, thing really emerged from that. So I'm very interested in this whole question of science and its place in culture, its place in human well-being, but also in a wider context. So I want to talk to you about this wider context. When I was studying uh, science at high school, when I was aged about 16 or 17, it did seem to me very, very obvious that science entailed atheism. In other words, that uh, the natural sciences, because of their methods, because of their working assumptions, inevitably moved you towards atheism as a worldview. And I don't think I really thought that through. I think it was more that just I assumed that this was self-evidently correct, that you, you could not be a thinking person studying natural sciences and at the same time have any real place for religion or belief in God in your life. And I changed my mind about this when I began to study science at Oxford. I think there were a number of reasons for doing this. Um, I think there was this feeling that atheism was not perhaps as well evidenced as I had thought. I think also I began to realize that there were other ways of looking at things. And perhaps I could mention uh, one line of thought which was particularly important for me. Uh, some of you will have read the writings of the philosopher Wittgenstein. And in his philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein very often uses the image of um, being trapped by a particular way of seeing things. He says we were held captive by an image, German word built, uh, and we cannot get out of this. And the point he's making is that really very often we find ourselves locked into certain ways of seeing the world or indeed seeing ourselves, and we just see things through that lens without realizing that there might be other ways of thinking about things. And in many ways, what Wittgenstein is doing is he's saying, look, imagine a picture gallery where there are different ways of looking at the world, and you're committed to one, but there are others. And maybe these other ways of looking at our world actually offer a better way of focusing, a better way of seeing. They are more satisfactory in terms of the quality of the rendering of reality that they allow us. And in many ways, that, that moved me to the position of seeing Christianity as something that was much more intellectually and aesthetically satisfying. Now, obviously, this raises a lot of difficulties. One of them would be, well, you know, what about the importance of evidence in thinking about these issues? I think that that is a very important point to make indeed. And certainly, I never felt that I was giving up something uh, and moving towards something that was irrational. It was rather that I began to realize that um, it was possible to prove things that actually were important but that didn't actually have huge existential significance. In other words, I was a scientist. I remained a scientist for another five years, um, studying chemistry and then doing research. And what I noticed was that science was very, very precise in terms of the methods that it used and the outcomes that it achieved. But in terms of deeper questions in life, for example, what is life all about? Um, how do we live a good life? Why are we here? In other words, questions of meaning and purpose and value. Science doesn't really help us very much. And that there had to be some way of beginning to gain traction on these deeper issues. And one of the reasons why I found myself drawn to think about the relationship 
between science and religion was this feeling that, in effect, we needed more than simply a functional account of things. What I mean by that is this that it's very important to understand how our universe works. It's very important to understand how we, as, as um, individuals, work. And that, I think, is something that, that is very important. But there are also these deeper questions about meaning and value. And we find there's a lot of interaction between these possibilities. Those of you who studied psychology will be aware of, for example, the work of Crystal Park in Chicago. And one of the points she makes is that having, she talks about a big picture of reality or a worldview or a way of seeing things which actually enables us to see things as a whole, to be able to make connections across a wide range of issues, bringing together, for example, functionality and meaning and value. Her argument is that this actually fosters psychological well-being and is very, very good for us in terms of our psychological stability. So one of the things I've moved towards thinking about is this whole question of the relationship of having, having a bigger picture of reality and being able to inhabit this universe meaningfully and authentically. Now, I come from England, and obviously in England we have our own set of authors that we read all the time, and I'm sure you have an equivalent set here in Spain. But one of the writers who I've read a lot is C.S. Lewis. And some of you will know that name. Lewis was uh, an English scholar at Oxford, and he was very famous for his work on 16th century English literature. But he also, of course, was somebody who discovered Christianity and wrote about this. And one of his basic ideas is that Christianity gives you this bigger way of seeing things, which allows you to hold together such issues as how things function and what things mean. And in a lecture Lewis gave at Oxford in 1945, he wrote these words, which I think are quite a helpful way of thinking about the approach that he's commending. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not just because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And the point that Lewis is making is that, in his view, Christianity is giving us, if you like, almost an intellectual illumination. It's like standing on a mountain uh, before dawn and watching the sun rise. And as the sun rises, you begin to see things more clearly. Sure, there are still shadows. Not everything is absolutely in focus. But you still see things more clearly than might otherwise be the case. And that, to me, is one of the things that I discovered when I embraced Christianity, this enhanced clarity of intellectual vision, if I can put it like this. But also, I think this is very important, this connecting up of how things work and what things mean. And that seems to me to be a very important thing to make, because we can all, I think, focus on questions of technicality. In other words, how we measure certain things, how we do certain things, and those are all very important. But I think we also want to think about these deeper questions, which is actually what is the bigger picture within which we are operating? How do we locate our commitment to science and human well-being with other issues about, for example, human identity and agency? And in this book, which I'll just borrow here, I try to talk about these things in a very accessible way, but also a way that is deeply embedded in the literature. And so let me try and raise some of the questions that are in this book, because I think you'll find them quite important and interesting. And one of them is this. It's a very important point, and it's to do with I use the phrase the epistemic situation of humanity, but I'll explain that more simply. What I mean by this is we find ourselves as human beings in a world where we try to make sense of things, where we try to prove things that we know we can believe. And yet when we do this, we find that the things that can be proved with absolute certainty actually turn out not to be very important. 
For example, you know, I could prove to you and you'll have no difficulty in accepting that two and two make four. But I, I don't think that's going to excite you. I don't think that's going to give you a reason to get up in the morning and say, you know, life has meaning. And the paradox that all of us have to face is basically this, that when it comes to really important questions, very often we have to say to ourselves, I think I can commit myself to this way of thinking. I cannot absolutely prove it, but I believe there is enough reason for me to say this is the way I'm going to think. Now, it's an important point. I'm going to illustrate this by looking at Albert Einstein, who many of you will know, have heard of. He's very, very significant as a writer, both as a scientist, but also as a public intellectual. And Einstein wrote very powerfully about the scientific method, making the point it was the only reliable method we have to be able to investigate the deep structure of the universe. And you all know about Einstein's contributions. We'll be celebrating the centenary of the confirmation of his theory of relativity later this year. But Einstein was very much aware that science was really, really excellent at helping us to understand the structure of this universe and how this universe worked. But he was also very clear that there were things that science did not touch on. And he mentioned two of these in particular, morality and religion. I'm going to talk about his politics because this, I think, probably helps me to make this point as simply as possible. Many of you probably will not know this because Einstein only really talked about this in one article in depth, but Einstein was a very active and committed socialist. And he gave lots of reasons for being a socialist, but none of those reasons were scientific. And Einstein, in effect, said, so, you know I'm a scientist, you know I'm a socialist. And some of you are going to say, my socialism is incompatible with my science. And Einstein says this is not the case, that a reflective human being finds that you use different methodologies, different ways of thinking, different ways of reasoning in, for example, the domain of physics, his domain, in the domain of biology, and then moving on into the realm of politics, ethics, and religion. And Einstein took the view that we use different forms of reasoning to develop our scientific thinking, different forms of reasoning to develop our moral views, and of course also our religious views. And Einstein's point is that these are not incompatible. It's not as if you use one single methodology to answer every question. It's rather that each discipline, its way of investigating our world, develops its own distinct way of investigating the world, but that for other purposes, for example ethics, you have to use different ways of thinking. You don't become irrational. You simply say, for these questions, we have to think in this way before we can answer them. So I just want to hold up Einstein as an example, a scientist and a socialist. And my question to you would be, do you think that he was inconsistent in feeling he could do both? Einstein didn't, and I don't think he's inconsistent either. But the point is, there may be methodological variation between science and ethics, but Einstein believed this arose not from the irrationality of ethics, but because you had to use a different way of thinking in order to answer questions. So Einstein gave a very famous lecture in 1939 at Princeton University in the United States. And his topic was science and religion. But he went wider than that. He also looked at human well-being and the question of what keeps us going in life. And his basic argument goes like this. Science is excellent. It makes connections between what we see in the world. It allows us to develop these broader theories. It allows us to actually understand how this universe functions. And then, of course, to some extent, to control it and be able to move it in directions that are important and helpful for us. 
But he then says this, and this is what I think is interesting. He says, but science is not able to engage certain other things. And he mentions three things. One of them is science does not help us determine what is good. Now, that is a very important point. For Einstein, you know, we do try to do what is right. That's very, very important for us. But if science can't actually answer that question, what is good, it doesn't stop us from trying to find the answer somewhere else. Secondly, Einstein says we need some kind of motivation to want to be good people. And he develops again this idea that science isn't really good at developing this motivation to be good. And then finally, Einstein says that in effect we're questing for a bigger picture. Um, he uses the German word Weltbild, uh, a picture of the world. But what he's saying is there has to be some way of integrating our science, our ethics, our religion, and in his own way, tried to find a way of doing this. So what I want to say is that Einstein thinks it is very important for personal well-being to integrate your thinking about science, your thinking about politics or ethics, and religion, and does not see you as committing intellectual suicide or losing sight of rationality in doing this. And so in many ways, I'm saying to you, how could we do this? Einstein is a very good example. But what we find with Einstein is he has his own personal way of holding these together, and it might not work for the rest of us. And so my question really is, how do we do this individually? How might I find a way of holding these together? How might you do this? Now, let me say immediately that you may, you may say, what you're saying is very interesting, but surely we can just think of science as one insulated compartment of our life. And then there's our ethical thinking. That's another isolated compartment. And then our religion. That's another compartment. And basically, these are different. So we don't allow them to interact. They're all fine individually, but we don't bring them together. And Einstein has his own answer to this. Einstein is that within each human being, there is this impulse to integrate, this feeling that we want to make connections, this feeling that we want to try and make connection between this and this and this, because that enables us to see these as interconnected and coherent. And so Einstein himself said this idea of a Weltbild, a picture of the world, is important in holding all of these together. And possibly, they might then interact. So that really is the whole area that Einstein is exploring. He's very, very clear that there are important questions that need to be asked, and we can perhaps have time to talk about some of those. But nevertheless, he's also saying there's something that needs to be done. So we find ourselves in a situation where the dominant narrative in Western culture is that science and religion are at war with each other, or to use the other word you'll find regularly used, they are incompatible with each other. So let me talk about these for a few moments. One of the questions we need to ask is where does this narrative of the warfare between science and religion come from? When did it originate? And the answer may surprise you. It is quite recent. It developed in the United States in the 1870s, the 1870s. And what then happened is that this narrative began to gain social traction, and people then used it to look back at certain controversies, such as Galileo or Darwin, which were then portrayed as science versus religion, although those of you who've looked at these will know they are far more complex than that. And actually, in many cases, it isn't really science versus religion at all. It's very often other things that are going on. And what I want to say to you is that this narrative is no longer taken seriously by historians. Since about 1990, um, many American, British, and Australian historians in particular have said this does not stand up to critical historical examination. But this narrative still persists in the media. 
And so one of the questions which I'm interested as an intellectual historian is why does this story continue to be told and to be treated as normative when actually its evidential foundations are very weak? So that's interesting, and we may have time to come back to that. But also this language of incompatibility. Let's again just think about this before I move on. The whole question of how each discipline does its distinctive task is very important. And what you find is that each community, for example, a biological community, a physical community, a chemical community, a historical community, finds that they develop their own distinct research methods, which is adapted to the nature of reality that they're investigating and the specific tasks they need to undertake. And we might summarize this as saying ontology determines epistemology. The way things are determine the way in which we can know them and the way in which we investigate them. And that means that different intellectual disciplines do use different methods. And there's a very interesting uh, paper by an English biologist called Stephen Rose. I mean, he's an atheist, he's very, very clear about that. But he, he makes this point. He's talking about um, a sort of mental experiment. He asks us to imagine five biologists watching a frog jump. And the question each biologist is being asked is, why did the frog jump? And these are five different biologists from different aspects of the discipline. And so the evolutionary biologist would, in effect, talk about how this impulse to jump is conducive to survival. Another might talk about the, um, the electrical impulses which cause the frog to jump, and various things like that. But here is the point that Stephen Rose is making. Each of these biological explanations comes from different sections of biology, and each of them is correct. The question is, how do we bring these different insights together to provide a bigger picture, a deeper explanation of why the frog jumped? And then he ends the essay by saying this. I hold to the ontological unity of reality but I must recognize a methodological pluralism. In other words, yes, reality is all one thing, but the section we're investigating means we have to use a specific way of thinking, a specific way of investigating. The task then is how we bring these things together. So that's one of the issues I talk about in this book. But what I want to say is really this is actually quite important for us to think about this how we build links between the different aspects of our lives. Do we compartmentalize? Here is my science. Here is my ethics. Here is my religion. Here is you add whatever you want to add. Are these all different and disconnected? Or is there a way of weaving them together? And in many ways, that's the issue which I think is important for us. So let me talk to you about a book that some of you will know about. This book appeared in 1999, and it's by the sociobiologist Edward O. Wilson. Edward Wilson, and the book is called Consilience, the Unity of Human Knowledge. Consilience, the Unity of Human Knowledge. And in this book, Wilson says this. He says, there are many areas of human knowledge. He's a scientist. So he says the science, that's really important. He talks about other areas, he says there's religion, I don't like that very much, but it's important. And says somehow we've got to make connections. And his argument goes like this, listen to this quote. We are drowning in information, but we are starved, starved of wisdom. Again, we are drowning in information, but we are starved of wisdom. And the point he's making is we know so much, and yet we can't connect it together. It's as if we have this you know, pyramid of information, and we don't really know what to do with it. It doesn't help us in terms of develop this bigger picture of life. And Wilson then says that the future is going to belong to people who he calls synthesizers. 
synthesizers. And what he means by this, people were able to, in effect, make links between the different areas of their knowledge. And that's what I think is really interesting and really important. Because, in effect, this is an invitation to try and build bridges between the different aspects of your professional and your personal lives. So it's something that's really interesting. And it also raises some questions about how we might try and make those connections. And so in this book, I try to offer some ways of thinking about this. And it's really in the final chapter that I try to focus on this deeper question of the importance of meaning. And of course, you will all know that word meaning is actually a very rich word. It's also a very complex word. When we talk about the meaning of life, what do we actually mean? And of course, there is a degree of cynicism about this phrase, the meaning of life. And that's largely because people very often give very simplistic or very glib answers to that when something much richer and complex is actually needed. But uh, sociobiologists uh, like E.O. Wilson will, will talk about their approach to this. But let's look at a social psychologist, and this is Roy Baumeister, in a book he published called The Meanings of Life. Roy Baumeister, The Meanings of Life. And in this book, Baumeister is not talking about what the meaning of life is. He does not answer that question. But he answers a different question. He's saying, as a social psychologist, what questions does a theory of the meaning of life need to engage? In other words, if something is to count as the meaning of life, what does it have to do? What, what questions does it need to engage? And his argument is that when you do that, you find there are four questions you need to engage. What I'm going to do is just talk you through each of them and see if you can make connections between them and what you're doing. Number one, the question of identity. Who am I? And Baumeister is very interesting on this. And, and one of the points he's making is that we have different accounts of what it means to be human. And if you're involved in biotechnology, if you're involved in any kind of biology, you will be familiar with these debates. And if I could summarize them very briefly, there is this deep question about whether humanity is simply an accumulation of atoms or molecules or physical components or biological components, or whether there is something bigger. And we can almost stand back and instead of talking about human components, talk about human nature. And it is a very real issue because certainly you will encounter some very reductionist accounts of individual identity or social identity. Um, one of those is due to the Nobel Prize winner, um, Crick, who discovered the structure of DNA. And he argues that we are you know, just simply a collection of neurons, that we are just an aggregate of molecules, and that is it. There is no more significance to us than that. And you can see immediately that this question of who am I is very important. Am I a collection of atoms and molecules? End of discussion. Or is that simply the beginning of a discussion which goes much further than that? Here's a glass of water. That consists of atoms and molecules. So do I. And if your theory of human nature can't distinguish between this and me, you know, there's something wrong with it. And so what you might then do is try to say, how do we develop an understanding of human nature which acknowledges the fact we are made up of physical components, we are biological creatures, we are this and that, and yet there is still something about us which is individual, special, and unique. And you probably know I've engaged with Richard Dawkins in, in dialogue about a number of things. But interestingly, on this question, he and I, he and I actually see things quite similarly. Uh, Dawkins at one point says we simply dance to the music of DNA. In other words, we are prisoners to our genetic inheritance. But, but we've got to find a way of breaking free from that. Dawkins is very interesting. He's saying, this is what I think as a geneticist, but I, there has to be more to us than that. 
And I find that very interesting, and also it raises some very interesting questions. Who are we? So that's one question. The next question is also, I think, very significant. It is, do I really matter? The question of value. So identity, value. And Roy Barmeister here is getting at two related questions. One of them clearly is, how do I identify what is good and pursue it? But there's also a deeper question, he says, that is really important. And it's this fundamental question, do I, do each of us here today really matter? Are we significant? And Barmash says that is a really important question. Um, there's a very interesting book by Alex Rosenberg, an American philosopher, called An Atheist View of Reality, published in 2011. And in this book, Rosenberg is simply saying, as an atheist, here is what I, as an atheist philosopher of science, think about life's big questions. And he answers them as a scientist. What I want you to notice as I talk about this is actually he's working on the assumption that science alone is able to answer to our, our questions. So here are the questions he asks. What is reality? It's what physics tells us it is. What is the meaning of life? There is none. If you unpack that, it means science is unable to tell us what the meaning of life is. Therefore, there is no meaning. Or again, is there a God? No, meaning there is no scientific case to be made for God. But listen to this one. This is perhaps the most interesting of this. Is there a fundamental difference between right and wrong? And his answer is very, very simply, there is no fundamental difference between these. There is no fundamental difference between these. Now, when I first read Rosenberg's discussion, I felt I had probably misunderstood him. I thought he was probably saying that science isn't able to make a distinction between right and wrong, and then move on and say, but as a philosopher, I think this is a very important question, and therefore we need to talk about the big questions of moral philosophy. But he doesn't actually say that. He simply says there is no fundamental difference between right and wrong. I have to say, I don't think I could live with that because it so clearly raises these very deep questions. So Roy Barmaster is really saying you need an integrated view of reality which is able to engage with that question, not just who you are, but why you matter and how you decide what is good and how you actualize that in existence. His third category is also very interesting. It's a question of purpose. We need to feel that there is something bigger in life, that we are part of that, that we are doing something which is going to be good for us, maybe, but also good for, well, this world in general. And, of course, an increasingly important question, but it's one that actually very often we're reluctant to think about. But it is an important question. Science is very good at telling us how we came to be here. We can all agree on that. But that doesn't mean we know why we're here, i.e. what we feel we ought to be doing. And I'm sure many of you who are engaged in any form of medical science are here precisely because you feel this is something important to do. In other words, there's a very strong sense of purpose here. This is something I want to study because I think I can use this well and wisely in life. And the final thing that he identifies, the fourth point, is the issue of agency. And the question here is, can I make a difference? In other words, is there some way in which I, as an individual, can do something which actually moves things on, which makes this world a better place? So Baumeister is saying, those are, those are the four big questions we need to think about. And in this book, I try to talk about how um, science may help us think about some of these but it doesn't actually deliver answers, but we need those answers. And maybe that is where religion really comes into its own. Some of you will know about um, you know, the intensive scientific study of religion we've seen in the last three decades, but one of the things that comes out very clearly is that what religion seems to be very good at doing is generating systems of meaning. In other words, it engages each of those questions that I've just given you, taken from the works of Roy Barmeister.
And so it's a very important point that it actually, it actually helps us to think about trying to develop a bigger picture of life in which science is there, very important. It helps us understand how the world functions, and we can perhaps build on that to work out ways of trying to make the world a better place. But we need something more than this. And what I'm saying to you is that we don't need to compartmentalize. Here's my science, here's my religion, they're just different, let's leave it like that. But actually they can interpenetrate and interact. And to me, that's a really interesting possibility to consider. And of course, it's what this book tries to do in a very accessible way. It's trying to say that we can hold these things together and it gives us a bigger way of thinking about this. And so it invites us to think about questions like, you know, in what way might science be enriched by religion? In what way might religion be enriched by science? For example, if you think about that latter question, what way might religion be enhanced by science? Think of Psalm 19, which opens with these words, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. In other words, you go out at the night sky and you're overwhelmed by its beauty, by its majesty, by its immensity. And, you know, that, that sort of way speaks to you of the, of the glory of God. And, of course, science help us understand the, that the world is even more complex, even bigger than we thought. And so it, it basically gives us this bigger and deeper sense of what nature is, and thus enriches our religious understanding. And of course, from a scientific side, it's very important. Science, in effect, saying religion needs to provide reasons for what it thinks is right. And that, I think, is a very important point. Because many of you will say, well, you talked about Richard Dawkins a moment ago, you need to talk about him a bit more, because surely one of the points he is making is that it is irrational to believe in, for example, God. And that, of course, is a very interesting point, and you may know that Richard Dawkins and I have debated on this theme. One criticism I would make of Dawkins would go like this. Dawkins uses a criterion of rationality to judge a religious person that he does not apply to his own viewpoint. In other words, Dawkins will say, well, you know, you're a religious person, right? Prove to me there is a God. It's a very high standard of rationality. It's a rationality that, that you'd expect from a scientist, and I think that's, that's very fair. But it's fair only if Dawkins applies that standard of rationality to his own beliefs, i.e., to his atheism. And the real difficulty here, as I think many of you will know, is that actually this whole debate, God, no God, lies beyond settlement by rational means. And one of the most interesting philosophers to talk about this is the British philosopher Bertrand Russell, who was an atheist, I think many of you will know, but atheist in a complicated way. Let me explain. In his History of Western Philosophy, Russell talks about why philosophy is so important. And here's the answer he gives. Philosophy allows us to live with uncertainty without being paralyzed by hesitation. And what he means by that is it helps us to cope with questions we cannot answer without giving up. And Russell was absolutely clear. You cannot rationally or scientifically prove there is or there is not a God. It lies beyond the scope of human reason to do this. But you'll say, well, just a minute, you said a moment ago, Russell was an atheist, and he was, but listen to this. Russell was absolutely clear that epistemologically, he was agnostic on the question, God, no God. But he chose to live as an atheist, knowing he couldn't actually prove that was right. In other words, he adopted a lifestyle which he believed was right, but knew he could not prove was right. And the reason I'm citing him is because he's an excellent example of a philosopher who says, look, this whole debate about God, no God, lies beyond resolution, but I've got to make up my own mind and live life out accordingly, so I'm going to choose to believe this, because I think it's okay, and live like that. And so my point in response to Richard Dawkins is that when we come to look at all of life's big questions, 
the ones that lie beyond logic and mathematics, which are very, very easy to answer. But in effect, they refer to a world inside our heads rather than a world connected up with what lies beyond us. The issue is that when you think about questions like, how do I live a good life? That's important. What is good? Or is there a God? Is there not a God? Or what should my politics be? You will end up, in effect, coming to a conclusion which basically is something you know you can't prove is right, but you still believe you have good reasons for accepting it, and you do. In other words, to use philosophical terms, it's not about proof, it's about justification, saying, here are the reasons I think this is right, and now I'm going to get on with this and do this. So I come back to this whole issue. I talked about the epistemic situation of humanity, and in many ways the point I'm making simply is that we end up finding ourselves in a situation where there are certain big questions we feel we need to answer. And we have these deep sense there are answers to be found, but we know we cannot conclusively show that our answers about our politics, our religion, and so on, can be proved to be right. And Russell as a philosopher is simply saying, this is our situation, let us therefore live like this. And I'm not for one moment commending relativism. You just believe anything you like. It's much more thinking about these things, thinking them through, making connections, but realizing that in the end, with the really important questions of life, you can't prove they're right. There's a very famous Oxford intellectual historian and philosopher called Sir Isaiah Berlin, who died about 20 years ago. And Berlin left um, so the Soviet Union um, during the 1930s to, to find freedom in Britain and was very concerned about what he called ideology, by which he meant a set of ideas which was so powerful it controlled you. He was thinking of either Nazism or Stalinism, but you can see what he's getting at. And he was very concerned about how people justify their belief systems. And so he did his research as a philosopher, as an intellectual historian, and said there are three categories of human beliefs. Those that can be proved logically, those that can be proved scientifically, and then those you can't prove in either of those ways. And he gives a few examples of logical proof, a few examples of scientific proof, like the chemical formula of water, is H2O. But then he says anything that is religious or anti-religious, anything that is political, anything that is social, anything that's ethical, is in that third category. You can't prove it to be right. And what Berlin is saying is don't be reduced to despair. Learn to live with this limitation placed on us, and actually, you can work within this, but just realize you cannot hope to prove the core beliefs that will animate your life. He then makes a second point, which for him is very important. It's all about liberalism. And what he means by that is, if I can't prove what I believe, and you can't prove what you believe, then let's, let's be nice to each other. Let's recognize we share this common difficulty in proving what we think is really right. So in a minute I'm going to wrap up. But what I say in this book is simply that this, what Einstein de describes as this impulse to connection, you know, this, this feeling we've got to try and hold things together, I think runs quite deep within many of us. And what I'm trying to say to you is that some of the things that sometimes hold us back are the feeling that because we're scientists, we have this very high standard of rationality, and politics and ethics and religion don't really fit into that. You know, you need to move away from that. It's, it's not quite that straightforward. And the issue is try, how you try to hold things together in a way that you think is meaningful and works for you, realizing that you're never going to be able to prove some of these beliefs, even though you know you can give very good reasons for them. Einstein found his own way of doing it. I found my way of doing it. I talk about it a bit in here. But basically what I'm saying to you is I think this is a very significant undertaking. And most of us actually end up doing this in one way or another. And this book here is really almost like trying to give you a framework 
for thinking this through for yourself. I've spoken for a very long time. You've been very patient. Thank you very much indeed for listening.